and welcome to the Critical Eye Asia podcast, Inspiring Leaders to Succeed. These podcasts are part review of a Critical Eye Asia leadership event that's just taken place and part expansion and broadening of that topic. One might call it bringing a critical eye to the subject. We're engaging on subjects at the forefront of business leaders' minds, which are always topical, thought-provoking, and will enable you to learn from leaders and peers delivering amazing results. Hello and welcome to this Critical Eye Asia's third in our series of podcasts. Um, I'm delighted to, to welcome uh, with me today Susan Chen and Mukta Arya, um, who I will ask to introduce yourself very shortly. Um, and really, this is a conversation um, following a, a recent event we had, uh, our Critical Eye Asia Leadership Forum, uh, where Susan and Mukta were both speakers. Um, and we covered quite a lot of topics in a fairly short period of time. So what I'd like to do today is, um, is, is welcome you both and ask you to introduce yourselves. And, and really, let's, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about all things HR and people and talent. Um, and, and I've got some questions to put to you. But first of all, um, can, I, can I hand over to you, Mukta? Just welcome. Thanks for joining us. Where are you from and, uh, and, and what's your, your background, Mukta? Uh, thanks, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm Mukta Arya, uh, Head of HR for Asia Pacific for Associated General. I'm based out of Hong Kong and have been with the bank for the last 16 years across India, Hong Kong, Singapore, and back here. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for joining us this morning, this afternoon even. Um, Susan, over to you. Hi. Hi, Michael. Thank you for having me here and good to be here. Uh, my name is Susan uh, and I head up the people function for Riot Games um, based in Singapore. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, I thought both of the sessions that you, you, you spoke about uh, on, on our recent uh, Asia, Asia Leadership Forum caused, caused a lot of um, feedback and a lot of questions and, and, um, and, and answers. Was there anything in particular that, that surprised either of you that, that came out from the session or questions that were being asked that you thought were, you know, were kind of left field or, or was it all sort of, um, you know, all in a day's work for, for, for you both. Susan, can I, can, I, can I start with you, first of all? Um, anything that surprised you from, from sort of some of the discussions you were, you were involved in and hearing? Sure. Um, I don't have a surprise, but if anything was a really good reminder about thinking about all these changes also within the context of Asia Pacific, because I think too often, you know, uh, us being based in APAC, we think about how do we make sure that we are heard globally? How do we make sure our counterpart fully understand how we operate here differently? Uh, I really like sort of there were questions about what does that mean for Asia leadership? within this new ways of work? What, it, what does this all mean for us in Asia? And, and I thought that was a really good reminder as we continue to think about the workforce of tomorrow, we are also thinking about how does Asia uh, and APAC this region continue to evolve? And does that demand something different or you know, something a bit more closer uh, to what we're seeing more globally? I think absolutely it's, it's certainly not a one size fits all um, sort of solution to, to, to how to engage and, and, uh, and train and, uh, and, you know, build up your workforce. But, but, but uh, from your side, anything that, that came out of it, particularly enlightening or, or surprising or, or anything you want to comment on, on the, the, uh, the discussions we had? Yeah, it was not surprising. But for me, um, what I gathered was that across industries, you know, the issues are very similar. So uh, we're talking about change and, uh, you know, transformation. And, and frankly, the issues related to culture, related to mindset are very similar, uh, whether it's, it's financial services or manufacturing. The way you do it, maybe it's a little bit different. But what I found that the underlying theme is the same. And then how you handle it, uh, in a sense, it's similar. Uh, you just have different ways of doing it. So uh, for me, it just reinforced my belief that uh, this is what it is. Uh, and these, these issues are universal and not just, uh, you know, constrained by uh, a sector or by a region. Yeah, ultimately, the common denominator is people, isn't it? And, and no matter what sort of sector or industry you're in, yeah. we're, we're all dealing with, with people. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of conversation around, and, and you mentioned it being, you know, specifically we were talking about uh, Asia-Pacific region, but it being important of sort of cultural and aware of cultural sensitivities, how, does, how difficult is that to implement, um, you know, blanket HR policies? Obviously, that's not what you do, but how, you know, you, you can be aware of cultural sensitivities, but then how does that affect sort of implementation and delivery 
Um, have you got any sort of I examples or, or, su or suggestions of how people might might look at that differently? Mm -hmm. um, Muxa, if I can start 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 with you. Yeah, you know, we grapple with this um, day in and day out. Uh, so, so since in general in Asia Pacific, we are in 12 markets. And uh, as you can imagine, the cultural sensitivity, uh, we have to be mindful because of the different regions we operate in. Uh, for, for some of the things, I have to make sure that discuss with the local management as well as HR to make sure that uh, what is what works for them uh they, they tell they tell us when we have a regional policy to be implemented just for example uh diversity and inclusion you know when we uh, wanted to have four networks in the region because we thought that's important for us we still had to go country by country and see that whether gender is it an issue everywhere and frankly it's not because gender when i say people think about women but it's a gender balance so for example in china and taiwan uh, for us uh, uh, there are more senior women than actually males you know so so it's the other way around lgbt yeah. plus uh, we have to be mindful because in some countries uh, we have it in hong kong and japan doing pretty well but in countries like china singapore we have to be mindful of the way we implement these policies so uh, for me, it is it is not one fit size all. We really have to assess each and every market about why we are doing it, what we are doing it, and how we are doing it. It's, it's everything. You have to really think very carefully before going uh, for it. Yeah. And then that has to fit in, or doesn't have to, but it should fit in with the, with the corporate culture or the, or the culture of the business itself and, and, and the culture of the leadership. Um, and I guess that then has its own challenges as well, where... If, if something from a particular region or country clashes with that, that, that must cause um, interesting conversations, I, I, I would say. Um, Susan, any, anything to sort of comment on that, how, how you then can, can manage the, the, the sort of cultural nuances across the region? I think a lot of it is how do we rethink about our approach of change management? And I think a big part is how do we start co-creating a lot of these policies? And, and I'm sort of we're thinking about uh, think about policy more as a broad framework, but really the imp uh, implementation and depth goes really into what re it's meaningful for each of the country. So instead of, I think, having the habit of sort of having all the answers at the headquarter level and sort of giving it to everyone, we actually essentially try to work with a very broad framework, like, for example, Mukta said, you know, about diverse inclusion, really understand what that means for us culturally, right, within the organizational culture, what does diversity look like, what does belonging look like, knowing what we're trying to achieve together, and then have a very broad framework around that, and then we really co-create the details with each of the countries or even the different business will have a very different meaning what that, that means. And I find that co-creation approach has really helped us as we continue to uh, uh, learn to be a more global company than just a company with international presence. I think that's a really key point. And it's a conversation I've been having more and more frequently with say multinational companies headquartered typically outside of Asia, who are then laying a sort of talent lens on what they feel their leadership pipeline should look like. I mean, there's, there's, there's very interesting questions around, you know, people, there was, there was a conversation around uh, building a culture of asking questions and not making statements, I think, um, and, and, you know, keeping open questions, open minds and possibilities. That, that's not always uh, in certain parts of, of the region. It's not always the, the, the way people operate. But how do you teach that? Um, or, or should you teach that without training people to become carbon copies of, of, of one another? I mean, that, that's possibly it was true maybe several decades ago of, um, uh, you know, women in, in, in financial services, for example. It was, it was, you know, you have to act like a man to be, to be successful. I mean, that, that, we're, I'm hoping we all find that terrifying nowadays. nowadays. But um, how, how, do you then, how, do you, how do you go about that? And how do you change the way that maybe the board or the senior management team look at what talent looks like in, in different parts of the world. I, I like your, your, the comment there, Susan, on, on co-creating. Mm. Surely that's, that's a really good way forward on that. Mumukta, do you have any, any thoughts around that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very important topic and uh, what we call in financial services, speak up culture, you know. And for me, it has many different dimensions uh, where, for example, a company has to have a culture where people are, they feel inclusive, you know, there is psychological safety and trust so that when they have an issue, they can speak about it openly. 
you know. So uh, for us, uh, it's also part of our code of conduct and, and part of our values, actually, where people have um, the courage to speak up. How do we uh, how do we enhance this kind of culture? One is through the managerial culture where we are training our managers to be more like coaches, you know, uh, looking at diversity and inclusion and how to actually create an inclusive environment, you know, and providing that psychological safety. So for me, a man, the manager in, in, in a company at whatever level, you know, whether they are first time managers, mid managers, senior managers, this is really important that they understand their role of creating that environment. And then only people will speak up. We do have, um, uh, you know, in our code of conduct, uh, a whistleblowing policy, uh, speaking up, and we encourage it uh, anonymously in case some people don't want to be named about it. And it works sometimes. And I have seen that people are speaking up more, you know, about certain behaviors, certain cultures. And uh, this for me is really important because if employees care about you, they will raise questions, you know which will lead to a better organization. So yes, uh, we, are, uh, we are working on it, especially in countries where people generally don't speak up uh, very easily. Uh, so then the environment that we are providing to them, uh, it actually helps in raising questions and also for us, you know, to make sure that we hear them and, and actually do something about it. Right. Because there's, yeah. you know, there's one thing about raising questions and then the other thing also about <laughs> what do you do with it? Are you making a change based on that or not? So, yep, yeah, it's an important it sounds, topic. It sounds like it's very much you. You're sort of setting the tone from the top, and if you know you're 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 showing by doing. I mean, if your leaders, if 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 you're really committed to this sort of culture, creating this sort of culture, everyone has to be involved and in, in, in exercise in that. Um, Susan, when, how about yourself and, and sort of companies you've worked for and are with currently? Um, how how do you sort of implement that that uh, that I guess it's about showing what you're doing or saying what you're what, doing what you're saying you're going to do i guess is, yeah. is leadership lens i'm actually going to give you a slight different uh turn uh just because i've worked in for the last few years very much focusing on startups sort of hyper growth startups so to a certain extent you know even raya is, is sort of an mc has been around for 10 years but just the nature of the game industry right and the way how fast things are going it, it's like a startup and there's beauty in the startup i think uh speak up culture is one that has been embraced and is part of our dna I do think I really like what Mukta talked about sort of is about how do you take action based on a conversation, right? A meaningful conversation. So our focus hasn't been about speaking up, but our focus is how do we have a meaningful conversation? And what does that mean is that you also don't want an environment where everyone feel awesome to speak up, but they stop stop becoming productive, right? Because then everyone has an opinion about something and, and opinions are wonderful. Everyone has one, but yes. as a company, in order to be productive, you actually need to have meaningful conversations. So I would say for our case, hasn't been about getting them to speak up, but it's how, how do we speak up in a way that helps us to move forward in, in a meaningful way? Yeah, I know, absolutely, and, and I think you know, again, it, it's it's showing people what you what you mean, and, and you have to have that exercise at the very top, highest levels of the company, and it, and it filters filters through. Um, to, talking about sort of skills and building skills, one of the one of the things that often comes out, and particularly in the last couple of years, is one of the top leadership skills um, that has been identified um, is resilience. Um, in conversations around the last financial crisis, where a lot of companies just didn't have the capability um, there because some of the leaders had not been through any particular times of crisis or, or, or serious times where they had to show that as a, as a, as a character or as a, as a skill. How do you train resilience? I mean, you, you put people into a, into, a, into a forced situation and leave them there for a couple of days and then <laughs> hopefully they'll come out alive and be better leaders. How, how, how can you, or how can you test it? You know, I'm, I'm just really interested in, you know, what, if this is a top leadership skill right now, how, how, is, how is that going to come through? For, for people who maybe you know have everyone's been through through the last couple of years so that's you know we're all building that skill <laughs> some better than others but yeah any any thoughts on 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 that as a leadership skill or, or indeed any other top you know skills that are that are really needed now and and for the for the coming years um again Mukta, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start with you put you on the spot on that one 
Yeah. So, um, you know, for leadership traits, um, companies have been doing programs for a long time and, and we also did the same. Resilience, we started actually talking about it around five years ago when it was still bubbling, you know, and then it was, uh, it was still nice to have and not something which was, you know, uh, something which companies needed. Um, we started doing that. And of course, the take up rate was um, in the in the beginning was slow. And then it went up because people felt that this is really important because when they are under pressure and under pressure could be any time the day to day work or it doesn't have to be crisis anymore. Or even you are juggling, you know, many things, including work life integration, then this becomes very important. So we have been doing that. We have had cases where we would support, you know, employees through uh, coaching, uh, executive coaching. Uh, through peer coaching, uh, also through counseling through EAP, because sometimes we feel that it is important where people are talking to somebody whom they don't know. So as a counselor, and it's anonymous and people don't know about it because not everybody in Asia, as you can imagine, is open to talk about their vulnerability. So they to really look at that. So for us, I think we had started doing it. But I can tell you that uh, this thing became really during COVID time, it came to the fore that that resilience is required. We did give support to employees through and managers through various, um, uh, you know, talks, but also training uh, and all. For me, people have to really internalize it and do it on their own. You know, you can teach only to some extent, but finally people have to really grasp it, internalize it and then see how it works for them. So the, the thing that you spoke about, about throwing people in hot water, you know, and then letting them swim, um, to some extent it does work, but uh, in an organization like financial services like ours, I think structured training does help. Coaching does help to a very large extent. And also whether the support, this support is available at a short period of time because things may happen all of a sudden you don't have to wait for months, you know, to go through these interventions. Do you have on demand these kind of support available? How how qualified your managers and and for example, HR HR people are to really provide that kind of support? So for me, it's a it's a it's a mix of everything, you know. Uh, it's a support system. It's an ecosystem that uh, we have to build to really help managers understand it. And of course, a lot comes from their own initiative, you know, which we should not, we cannot just spoon feed everything. It has to also come from there. And then Absolutely. it works. Yeah. And that's a trait you look for in, in your in your top talent. And you, and you, you want that to be innate if it's not there, obviously, already. But it's about how do you support that and bring it out? That's, that's, yes. Yes. Support at the right time. Yeah. Great. Uh, Susan, how about yourself? Any any thoughts on, on the, the resilience or indeed any other sort of what, what, what do you look for um, for, for future leaders when you're, when you're um, assessing talent? So I think, you know, both of you are right that we've been talking about resilience for so long, right? Like one crisis after another is becoming the new normal. Uh, but I think one thing so we, we, we try so the approach very much what Mukta have talked about both on the coaching side and also some structure learning. But what we have starting to, to find is that what is really important or useful is to let individuals define what their own resilience looks like. You know, in, instead of necessarily say what we would like you to look like to resilience, we say, how do you make meaning and connect with the term resilience? So what looks resilient for me may actually look quite different to someone else just because they have a different circumstance, different culture, aspect, understanding. Um, we think keep failing potentially is a part of that resistance, which will be very difficult in some part of Asia that we operate in. So keep forcing them to fail and wanting to learn that failure doesn't necessarily work. But resilience for them could be making very incremental changes all the time, every time, you know, going out of their comfort zone, even to learn something completely outside their function. Whatever it is, we want them to define what that looks like for them, define it, um, and, and sort of support them through that definition. And I think most important, actually, about resilience, what we can support as a company is to make sure that the employees feel like they have a sense of agency. They have choices. They have choices to be the resilient self. They can bring the most resilient self to work by knowing what that looks like. Because when someone tells you what it should look like, you almost feel like you can never deliver to that. 
So that's kind of a slight different approach that we're taking is, is not easy because by giving people that agency and also self-definition is also very ambiguous, right? So uh, is is a balance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds like yeah, a, a, bit, a bit of a mammoth task because it, it is, you know, it's, it goes very far from the one size fits all approach. But then you're, mm-hmm. you're then, not, I don't know if you're micromanaging certain regions or, or, or countries or but, but then again, it's empowering the, the people within that area to, to, to do, as long as you've got the com- company culture right, okay, does that sit above everything else? And that's really what maybe you're looking for, for that culture fit when, when, you're, when you're bringing people into the, into the company. Um, I'm, I'm interested, you know, we're talking about support and training on resilience. Um, where I, I often speak to, regularly speak to our, our members at, at sort of CEO and uh, level and more often than not, when you ask who their support is within the, within the business, it is HR. Uh, you know, it'll be their HRD or or, or someone that within within the function that they can they can sort of lean on. Um, where do you guys go when 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 you're looking for your support um, internally? Where, you have a punching bag in the corner of the office, or um, <laughs> what, where's where's your go to? Um, Almost season. time for wine. I gotta go. <laughs> 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 Absolutely, booty. Um, yeah, where, where, do you do you have any? Or is it, it's not just one person or thing. I'm sure, but any any sort of tips or, or suggestions that, that you've used in the past, and you've just thought, I need that. And it, yeah, it can be a nice bottle of red, but um, something a bit more um, uh, healthy, maybe. Yeah. Susan, any thoughts on uh, on on that? Well, I think having that word like credo, I think is a really helpful way to sort of connect with like-minded professional. I think that always helps. I mean, you know, some days I, I'll go, am I but crazy? I don't feel yeah. like it. I sort of understand where the chain of thought, but it's always helpful. And then, you know, all seriousness, I think forums or, or support network like this is helpful from the sense that we also can take a step back from just thinking about our organizational challenge and thinking about the bigger picture, thinking about Mukta, who's in a different type of organization, what she's working with, what she's dealing with, and very similar to Mukta's earlier reflection that we all essentially are dealing with very similar issue. It just shows up in a different way. And sometimes you just need that little bit of reminder that you are not alone, you're not completely crazy. Um, <laughs> And that helps you to continue. Um, but another one is I sort of keep reminding myself to continue to learn as in, you know, I don't know everything. Things keep moving and changing, uh, whether it's the employment law or just simply how we are approaching some of the learning methodology, technology. Uh, finding time to learn has always been helpful to, to keep me centered as a world just keep moving so fast that you have no time to think, uh, needless to say, to learn. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously then how do you, how do you manage that time and where do you go for your learning and how do you filter it through? But that's, that's, that's maybe for, 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 for another day. Uh, so from your side, any, any sort of specific support or, yeah. or, or references that yeah. you, can, you can refer to? Yeah, so as Susan said, and, and I completely agree, uh, I think sometimes we do, we do uh, bank upon, uh, you know, the network that we have, um, uh, whether HR, mostly HR, because I think they understand uh, better. Um, for me, I also have, uh, I write. So, so sometimes when I have a difficult issue and, and I really cannot speak to anyone, you know, so I write and for me, this is the way um, I take out take out things and sometimes you know ideas come in the middle of the night and all and because I've written it down it's like more concrete you know what the issue is so that is uh, another one and then for me um, really I think it is um, it is uh, my best friend for example who doesn't know what's happening in the company etc we we don't take any names but sometimes I might discuss some issues, you know, which are there. You you do need an outlet somewhere. And I think we all have our different ways of finding things. You know, for me, it works. Uh, but you do need you do need some uh, some sort of uh, where you are using, um, where you're taking it out. You know, you have to yeah, take it yeah. out. And Otherwise, it becomes a problem. And you need that sort of whether it's creativity, whether it's some outlet, you need you need to be you know can't overwhelm yourself. Otherwise, you you lose that that opportunity. Yeah. I remember one one of our um, uh, earlier meetings, uh, physical boardroom style discussion we had in Singapore, and it was it's quite a serious topic. And uh, I I remember towards the end, one of the members sort of uh, started speaking about how he deals with stress and 
And he said he has a cupboard, in, quite a large cupboard in the corner of his office. And he'll go in there, he'll shut the door and he'll just scream at the top of his voice. And I, I thought, was, everyone around the table thought, well, that's a great idea. I need to get myself one of those covers. And that was the key takeaway from, from the topic. But it, it just goes to show just from what you've both said, you know, you, you, sometimes you just need to stop and reflect and think, it's not just me. You know, everyone's dealing with, with similar challenges and how, how do we share those? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but I think we're sort of coming to, towards the end of our uh, allotted time for discussion. Um, I just wanted to say thank you both for a for you know for joining us today and for sharing again. Um, really, really great to have you on the, on the podcast, and look forward to seeing you at, uh, at future Critical Eye events. And um, thanks, thanks to the team in in, in London for uh, for setting us up and uh, having having the podcast. Good to see you both. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.